Okay, can I call to order committee, please? Thank you. Um, a warm welcome to those attending and to our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. My name is Councillor Henry Higgins and I am the, chairing, the chairman of this committee. Uh, details of business to be considered today are shown on the agendas, copies of which are accessible in the room and underneath the live broadcast. For those presenting in the room and attending to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statement you will make will be recorded and made public. A reminder to anyone speaking today that your voice will only be audible online when the microphone is switched on. We are not expecting any fire drills today, so if the uh, fire alarm goes off, please follow officers out of the building. Uh, mobiles and tablet devices, uh, for those in the room, please uh, switch off your mobile phone or put it on silent, please. Uh, please note that you, like myself, are using computers to review the agenda. And uh, so, and other members of the committee are, are to do that, and officers. Attendees before, uh, attendance before, I'll introduce the councillors first. Uh, Councillor Adam Bennett, who is my vice chairman, welcome. Uh, Councillor Chubadar. Welcome. Councillor Cawthorn, welcome. Uh, Councillor Nelson, welcome. Uh, Councillor Garlic, welcome. And Councillor Singh, oh, you are, you're in the front there. You threw, threw me there for a minute. <laughs> welcome. Uh, uh, we have officers today who actually help us do our business today. Uh, I have Ros Johnson to my right, Head of Development Management and Building Control. Kate Crosby is Area Planning Service Manager, Ed Lawton, Strategic Applications and PPA Manager, Chris Brady, Planning Team Leader, uh, Hayden Richards, Principal Planning Officer, Christos, uh, Chris Athos Uthu, I think that's correct or not, if you forgive me if it isn't, <laughs> Planning Officer, uh, Dr. Alan Tilly now, Transport for London, welcome. Uh, and, uh, Shia Assad, legal advisor, Jimmy Walsh, legal advisor, and Ryan Deller, who's a democratic officer, who makes sure that I've actually read all that correctly and got it right. I hope so. Anyway, um, we're going to go to to the agenda now. Apologies for absence, please, Ryan. Yep. So we have apologies from Councillor Roy Camdow with Councillor Cawthorn substituting. We have apologies from Councillor Davis with Councillor Cubitter substituting. And we have apologies from Councillor Mand with Councillor Nelson substituting. Welcome, substitutes. You've all spoken to the committee. Um, also, declarations of interest and matters becoming before the meeting. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, agenda items eight and nine Cedar House and Vine Lane. So, it's on the paperwork as Uxbridge Ward, but it's actually Hillingdon West Ward, where I am the member for. Um, I know the petitioner, and I've spoken to them and local residents about the, the site, so I will step out. Thank for the you. discussion vote on that. Thank you very much. Uh, there's matters that have been notified in advance or urgent. There is none. Uh, to confirm that all matters of business are in part one, so nothing's in part two, so everything will be in public. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, just about to do that. And uh, can I have those uh, minutes agreed from the last meeting? Agreed? Yeah, okay. So what I'll just give you... I'll get, I'll get, I know what you're going to ask. So I'll, I'll, I have a very good memory. What we do is we'll have, we're having petitions. The order of the petition will be the petitioner, the applicant and agent, and then the ward councillor. Is that answering your question? Sorry, councillor. Uh, no, uh, I'm actually, I live in the ward. We've got a planning, a proposal, sorry, a plan uh, for using the ward. So I live in the ward. I'm the ward councillor as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you, well, you're speaking on behalf of the yes. ward councillor? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Okay, um, your petitioners will have five minutes, applicants have five minutes, as wall councillors only have three. Um, we have a very easy traffic light system. So green is for four minutes, amber is one, and red will mean that I will stop you. And I will stop you, so please don't think I'm being rude. That's, what it, that's the way it is. Okay, so we'll go to the first item. I think I've covered everything else that's off. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah. That's it. The first item is item six, land of Usley Library and former Usley Pool, uh, Falling Lane and Otterfield Road. 
and that is Chris. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, before I start the presentation, I'd just like to draw members' attention to the addendum for this item, um, which involves two changes to key conditions. Um, item 6 relates to the redevelopment of the land at Usley Library on Falling Lane and the former Usley swimming pool site on Otterfield Road. The proposal seeks consent for the demolition of the existing building and construction of a building on both sites um, of up to, eight, up to five storeys in height, comprising of 95 residential units in total, a replacement library with associated community use space, 53 car parking spaces and associated amenity space. Um, here we have a location plan with both sites indicated in pink. Um, you'll also see the access to the Otterfield Road site, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, which um, is, is actually formed from Otterfield Road. The Falling Lane site is shown um, to the west of this plan um, in the up left-hand corner. Um, here we have a constraints plan, which highlights the constraints for the development. Um, you'll see that there are no particular constraints for either development site. Uh, here we have uh, another location plan, just with its existing context. Um, a bird's eye view plan. Again, you'll see the two sites um, lined in red. Um, I thought it would be useful to include a bird's eye view plan of the Otterfield Road site in its um, former use. That is the former swimming pool building, which you see um, within that red line boundary. Um, here we have an existing library plan. Um, the Otterfield Road site no longer has a building on it, so it, it is indeed a vacant site at the moment. Um, you'll notice that the only means of um, accessing the community use space on the first floor is via the stairs on the left-hand side via the entrance. Um, here we have a proposed site plan. This is of the Otterfield Road site. Um, you'll see the outline of the ground floor of the building on the left-hand side. Um, proposed car parking, which also includes uh, the retention of 15 park and stride places, um, parking spaces to the right-hand side marked in, in blue. Uh, that is an existing arrangement with um, the Rabs Farm School, um, who are sited to the north. Uh, this is just a proposed landscaping plan, which indicates some proposed landscaping uh, within the scheme. You've got a proposed ground floor plan. Uh, this is the Falling Lane site still. Proposed first floor plan of the Falling Lane site. Second floor plan. Third floor plan. And fourth floor plan. And there you have a roof plan. Um, here you have some elevations. You'll see that the fifth floor is set back from the, um, the lower floors and it does not carry across the entire roof, roof form. Uh, southeast elevations, uh, proposed northeast elevations. Um, here are some sections of the building and some context elevations. Here we have the proposed site plan for the Otterfield Road site, including the entrance to the site itself off of Otterfield Road. Uh, the library building is um, in lighter grey uh, sorry, in the top left-hand corner of the, the plan. Pro's landscaping plan, you've got the ground and first floor plan, proposed second and third floor plan, fourth and roof plan. Here are some elevations, you'll notice that there is a stepped height, it ranges from two storeys, three storeys up to five. Proposed east elevations, north elevations, south elevations, proposed sections. The application also includes an indicative park enhancement plan, which is uh, used to offset and deliver park enhancements. Um, normally we would suggest that uh, a open space contribution is required. Uh, this application is actually delivering those, those enhancements itself. Here we just have a photo of the rear of the building, existing building, photo from the high street, 
again from the high street. This is the Rabs Farm car park. Existing building within its context, that's uh, a four-story building directly opposite the, the application site on Falling Lane. Here we have Otterfield Road, the hoarding outside of Otterfield Road. That's a view from within the council car park of the Otterfield Road site directly facing the front of the building. This is the car park looking south, which immediately bounds the site. Um, in terms of the assessment of the application, as set out in the committee report, the proposal has received support from internal and statutory consultees. The objections raised following the public consultation have been noted and addressed within the committee report. Regarding comments relating to the, the restricted covenant on the Otterfield Road site, the applicant has undertaken an appropriation process which has been concluded and a JR period has now expired. Whilst this is not a matter for consideration by this committee this evening, it is important to confirm that the land has now been appropriated for planning purposes. It is key to note that the application proposes 94 affordable homes, equating to a 100% affordable scheme, which is far above the 35% minimum requirement within the London plan. It also proposes an appropriate unit mix with at least 20% family-sized homes being delivered on site. As set out in the committee report, although the proposal is to relocate the existing library to the Otterfield Road site, this site is within the town centre. Therefore, the library, which is a town centre use, is being retained within its town centre boundary. Moreover, it is clear that the existing plans and photos indicate that the existing library does not perform well in terms of accessible standards, particularly in terms of wheelchair accessibility. The new library would be located on a single level, including the community use space, and would be designed to the highest accessible standards, thus providing a more inclusive building for the usually and westrating community. Overall, the proposal conforms with the key development plan policies. Where harm has been identified, the applicant has produced a proposed acceptable mitigation measures and a suite of benefits, which includes the 95 affordable units, a more inclusive and accessible library and community use space, a suite of park and highway network enhancements, which are considered to outweigh the potential and limited harm identified. For, those, for these reasons, and those set out in more detail within the committee report, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, we go to uh, the petition, which is a written response, so we're going to have to listen to the lovely tones of Ryan now for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to present this statement in support of the petition. Where is the evidence of usually residents saying we want more flats? The opposite is the case. We counted the residential developments in Usley. Since 2008, we estimate that 1,525 residential units have been built. There may be more. Hillingdon Council does not appear to publish a site map with the number of new residential units that have been built by ward for council taxpayers to assess. For a long time, residents of Usley have felt they are ignored by Hillingdon Council. For example, in 2017, we organised a paper petition which said, we formally request that Hillingdon Council provides funds to run a new swimming pool at the site of the old Usley pool off Otterfield Road. Currently, the leisure centre which Hillingdon Council decided to build in West Drayton, a waste of, ca of council taxpayers' money, is sitting on an empty building site with a company that was building the leisure centre having gone into administration. If the council had accepted that usually residence petition proposal, we would have had com a compact pool on the Otterfield Road site. It would have withstood the economic risks that the Ukraine-Russian war has caused in terms of energy costs to swimming pools up and down the country. Residents could leave their children swimming in a small local pool and go shopping in Tesco, Audi, Iceland and had a cup of coffee and a custard tart down the high street. I had a stroke in 2019 and have not attended today's Hillingdon Council Planning Committee in person owing to ongoing health issues. Accessibility of the planning documents. Since my stroke I have experienced difficulties reading documents. I used to enjoy reading but find it difficult to read long documents, especially those that are online. Most residents do not understand the planning documents that have been posted on Hillingdon Council's website. We counted the number of pages of the proposed planning application being considered by the planning committee. The number of pages came to 1,357. When we asked the planning officer which planning policies applied, he sent us a list and the number of pages in the policies came to 1,869. 
It is obviously impossible to read all these and to understand complex planning laws in such a short space of time. We would formally request that the committee remove this item from the agenda of the December 2023 meeting to allow more time for residents to consider the proposals. As far as I could see, the planning officer's report did not include the outcome of the so-called consultation which occurred in October 2023 at Usley Library. This said that the majority who attended were against the proposals. We found this out after a Freedom of Information Act request which took longer than the cor correct time scale. The borough solicitor wrote the reason for the delay is that in July 2023, the council introduced a new IT system for dealing with Freedom of Information requests. We had expected the new system to streamline the process, but unfortunately it has had the opposite effect. It has proven very difficult to keep track of requests, and it was for this reason that in September 2023, we reverted to using the old system, which, although cumbersome, has helped improve performance significantly. Unfortunately, the glitches in our new system meant that it was not possible to deal with your request for internal review within our usual timescale. This maladministration means that the information was not available in time for people to make effective responses to the planning applications. Kennington is making this application on its own behalf, yet the planning officer refused to disclose the details of the pre-application advice. Kennington Council wants to mark its own homework. Nolan principles require openness and accountability. The Stroke Association leaflet called What We Think About Air Pollution, published in 2019, says that air pollution increases your risk of stroke. It contributes to an estimated 21% of strokes worldwide, and in England alone, experts predict that it will contribute to around 160,000 strokes by 2035. Air Quality in Hillingdon, a guide for public health professionals, was published by the Greater London Authority in 2022. This report shows that usually schools, including St Matthew's Church of England Primary School, Rav's Farm School, the Skills Hub and Pride Academy, are all listed as having pollution levels exceeding WHO guidelines. In Usley High Street, the report shows it is, it is a pollution hotspot. The prevalence of asthma is five, in Usley is 5.47%, which is lower than England, but higher than Hillingdon, London and the locality. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, committee, some of that stuff is... Uh a little bit irrelevant to the planning applications, so be aware of that. Um, it's always nice to mention the custard tart, but anyway. The, um, the applicant and agent, is it Humphrey or is it Evans? Uh, is it both of you? On? Okay, well, you have five minutes. So yeah, you, the lights aren't working. Yeah, they will time. do in a minute. As okay, soon as you start sorry. talking, they'll go on. Um, uh, before answering any technical questions from members, we'd like to just highlight some of the benefits um, that these schemes will bring to Usley. Um, most importantly, it's 100% uh, affordable. It's providing 95 new homes um, secured at London affordable rents. 20% um, are three beds, 37 two bed units, and 43 one bed units. And 10% of these will be wheelchair accessible flats. Um, there has been engagement with the community and other stakeholders and that resulted in extensive design changes um, to address those concerns. Um, in particular, um, we reduced the height from seven storeys to five as part of that consultation. Um, there are also commitments to significantly enhance the recreation ground with a new playground, um, a family-focused landscape garden and extensive new tree planting in the recreation ground. Um, there are also proposals to upgrade the public pedestrian access route to the library from the town centre, including new lighting, footpaths and signage. Uh, the falling lane development uh, will re-provide the existing spaces for the Rabs Farm school parking. Um, the usable area of the library has been increased by 20% and it also now offers a modern versatile space to future-proof the broad range of services the library offers. Um, Within the library, there's also 75 square metres of dedicated community space included. Um, the development protects the ancient highway that runs along the, uh, the uh, boundary of the Otterville Road site. And finally, this is a highly sustainable development that utilises the two brownfield sites in the council's ownership. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing from you, Mr Evans? No? No? Okay. Fine. It's, you can, you've got a couple of minutes, so... We were just here to answer any technical questions. That okay, fine. Thank you very much. Um, next is um, Councillor Abbey. 
whenever you're, you're ready. Or, oh, you, so you, you can, um, can, you can I both pass it over to my, co uh, my colleague first to I'll, I'll okay. second after that. Councillor Pooja. Residents have been fighting against the residential development of Usley Recreation Ground since 2011. Here I am in 2023 speaking on a planning application that has appropriated land gifted to the residents in 1926 which was protected by a covenant to remain forever recreational. I draw your attention to how the local plan has been cast aside for this planning application and why it should be refused. Quantity over quality. Clause 3 of the local plan says 70% are meant to be two and three bedroom homes. Only 56% are. Why when waiting lists for family homes are critical? Single aspect properties are a symbol of poor quality housing. 7.9 of the local plan says that quantity will not be provided at the expense of quality. Nearly half of the properties have windows on only one side. Why is poor quality being recommended for planning approval? Air quality. The air quality assessment rec records figures from 2019, but I could not see recent figures on there. Surely the more recent figures are needed to assess pollution impact. The advantage of mechanical ventilation is it enables developers to build in areas of poor air quality where windows cannot be opened. The disadvantages are high energy consumption, high repair costs, noise and vibration, moisture build-up leading to mould. What a burden on the council budget. As a council, we should not be asking people to live in areas where they cannot open a window because the air quality is so bad, should we? Health street strat healthy street strategy. This applicant takes, application takes into consideration a healthy street strategy, yet approves the removal of a library from its ideal high street location, where it is within ease of public transport, with a bus stop right outside, en route home from school, safe to access, place for public amenities, anchor for regeneration, and a quiet space for rest. Usually library in its current location meets the healthy street strategy, the relocation will not. Precedents. Previously, a health centre, gym, and residential dwelling was given planning permission. It is true precedence, precedence has been set, but the health centre with Jim brought untold value to the community. The need for health centre is critical then and is critical now. What extra needed facilities is the relocation of the library given residents? None. Environment. According to Hillingdon's Open Space Strategy 2011, Usley was deficient in green space by 40 hectares. Population has grown, but green spaces haven't increased, so appropriating land donated for recreation is simply disingenuous. I cannot tell you how disappointed I am to be sitting here today, how truly repugnant I feel find this situation where usually residents have been ignored time and time again and local communities ruined by the continuous catastrophe of poor planning decisions that blight usually. In listening to this, I hope that this committee rejects this application or hangs their head in moral shame. Thank you. Councillor Abbey, do you want to speak something? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've had a statement ready for this. And I think it's time that we be re quite realistic. I won't be reading my statement. Um, the council obviously says we're putting residents first. I'm hoping that this committee today will listen to the residents of Usley and Cowley and stop obviously this um, you know, misguided um, proposal and application. It's vital that we, we obviously as elected members, we represent the residents and I'm hoping that obviously there'll be a change today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, um, some remarks were made and stuff. I'm gonna let officers before I go to committee to verify some of those things. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've just been taking notes um, as we heard the petitioner's speech and also um, from the applicants and the councillors. So I'd just like to address some of the key issues that were raised. So first of all, um, the petitioner questioned the need for um, residential housing. So I'd just like to draw members' attention to section 7.01 in the committee report. Um, and in this section of the report, we explain that the London plan sets um, challenging housing targets for all the London boroughs and for Hillingdon, um, there is a 10-year housing target um, of 10,830 homes. So it's also worth drawing members' attention to the fact that this site actually lies within the Heathrow Opportunity Area. So opportunity areas are defined um, in the London Plan as areas identified with the highest potential for development growth. And in this particular opportunity area is identified as having an indicative capacity of 13,000 new homes and 11,000 new jobs. So it's clear that there is um, a need for residential housing. 
In terms of this specific proposal, um, I'd just like to draw attention um, to the fact that this scheme would deliver 95 affordable homes. So that's 100% affordable housing. So that would make a significant contribution. And in particular, it's important to note that it would all be 100% London affordable rent, which is the tenure that's um, in most, um, of for most need. So just um, turning now to some of the other points raised, um, the petitioner raised a concern about the accessibility of the planning documents. So obviously, um, you know, have, um, you know, take into account their comments there, but I would just like to be absolutely clear that the council has carried out um, all of the statutory consultation in accordance with planning legislation um, and where we have been approached by residents um, requiring additional needs, and um, we have obviously accommodated that to the best of our ability. So I'm satisfied that we have um, carried out the consultation process correctly and that um, there has been a fair opportunity for residents to comment and take part in the planning process. Um, in terms of consultation, there was also um, a reference to the consultation that the applicant carried out. Um, I believe that was in October of 2022. So just to be clear, um, whilst that's obviously taken place beforehand, the applicant confirmed that there has been changes to the scheme following on from that. So it's important that as part of the planning process, the local planning authority carries out its own consultation, which is what we've done. Um, and that we base the planning decision on the comments that we've received through that. So that is why the report focuses on the consultation that was carried out as part of this planning application process. Um, so another point that was raised was regarding the pre-application process, um, and it was commented that um, the planning officer didn't um, divulge the comments that were made at pre-application stage. I just wanted to be absolutely clear that pre-applications um, are submitted and dealt with in confidence, and that's the same for every, every applicant. So we've treated um, the applicant who is the council the same as um, every, everybody else in this process. Another issue that was raised was air pollution. So I just wanted to, um, to clarify that the development as proposed is air quality, um, air quality neutral, and there is also uh, mitigation measures proposed in the form of contribution. Um, which would actually um, ensure that the development was air quality positive, and that's a requirement because of the designations for this particular site. So just to be clear, that, that does comply with the planning policy in that respect, so there is nowhere to go in terms of a, an air quality refusal. Another matter that was raised, and we've heard briefly from the case officer as well, is regards to the covenant. So I just wanted to be absolutely clear, um, covenants relating to land are not a planning matter. Um, it's not something that we can take into consideration as part of the assessment. Um, but for members' information, there has been a separate process which has taken place, a separate legal process where um, there's been an appropriation of the land for planning purposes. So in effect, that sort of releases it from the covenants, and if we require any further information on that, my legal colleagues, um, I'm sure, will, will assist there. And then finally, um, there was a point raised regarding the relocation of the library. So just again, wanted to confirm what my colleague Chris has said, the relocated library would still fall within the, the boundary of the town centre, so that's an important point. Um, and officers consider that the, the re-provided library would be of a higher standard and higher accessibility standard, and it would include um, an accessible community space. Um, so we consider that the relocation is acceptable and complies with planning policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ros. And the other thing is about the quality of the build was mentioned by, I think, um, yeah, Chris, Chris, you want to take that? Yeah, um, I think, so, thank you, Chair. Um, I think part of the quality of the build was suggested that it was an issue to do with um, single aspect units. I think seven, um, section 7.9 of the, the committee report actually gives a true reflection of the number of single and triple aspect units on both, both sites. Also, when we're looking at single aspect units, what we're actually trying to protect um, occupiers from is single aspect units which are north facing because of the limits on daylight and sunlight. It is worth noting that there are no single aspect units which would be north facing in this development at all. Um, just one other point, just on the open space. Um, it, it's, it's quite well documented in some of the appeal history that we've got in, on surrounding sites, which has been fairly recent, that um, the appeal inspector has not necessarily agreed with the council's um, provision for securing um, uh, financial contributions towards open space. 
um, this particular scheme doesn't um, secure a financial obligation, it actually delivers um, uh, an enhancement to the pu public open space. There is no development undertaken actually within the public open space, which you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, therefore, we do not feel that there is an issue uh, or a concern relating to the loss of public open space. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to take up on the addendum, please, Ross? Yeah, just to clarify for members, so there were some amendments to conditions proposed in the addendum, and that relates to the landscaping condition for the two sites. Um, and the addition into the condition wording was to include a requirement for um, pollution absorbing plants to be included in the soft landscaping. And the reason for that is obviously to improve air quality as part of the package of air quality mitigation measures. Thank you. That's something I make sure that it's always on our committees and if you see the addendments on every single item that come in before us. So I'm going to open it to the floor. So who wants to take me away first? Councillor Bennett? Councillor Cawthorn? Councillor Singh? It's only committee members, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you, Councilor Chairman. Um, I live in a, an apartment. I think I'm probably one of the only councillors who does that single aspect. I, I, kind of offended to say that my property is poor quality, but I'll, I'll move on to the matter at hand. Um, I, I think, you know, this is, this is there's a lot of history to this site, but I think certainly I look at it in terms of the positives. You know, we've got an unused brownfield site that has sat uh, as is for a number of years. Um, you know, we're getting 100% affordable housing, a new playground, a much bigger library. I drive past that library every day to work. It's, uh, it, it's dated. Um, it's going to need to be rebuilt at some point. This is a great opportunity to, to have a modern facility uh, still in the heart of the community that's much bigger. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I very much like the application and, and just want to uh, thank the officers for the amount of time and effort that's gone into it. Thank you. Councillor Cawthorn. <clears throat> thank you. Just a couple of questions to begin with, um, if I may. Um, Councillor Punjra indicated during her uh, presentation that um, there were, we, we had in some way, uh, I think she used the word, cast aside the local plan. Um, can I just confirm with officers, and we've heard a bit from Ros Johnson about this, can I just confirm that uh, in, in no respect have we done that and uh, that there are, there are no policy conflicts in what's before us now? And perhaps another question, or unless you want to answer that one first. Okay, let's do the other question. Um, the report on top of page 12 in the summary uh, talks about uh, impact on nearby residential properties being acceptable. Um, I'm just wondering, because clearly that, that, that's at odds with what you know, we're hearing from the petitioners, just for the benefit of the watching public, it, is, there, is that based on some kind of assessment, that judgment, that the impact will be minimal and acceptable, or is that the subjective view of the case officer? Thank you. Either one of you, I don't <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'll start with the development plan question, then I'll um, defer to Chris, um, who will have the details of the assessment on neighbour amenity. So just to be absolutely clear then, so when we assess a planning application against the development plan, there are obviously a sort of multitude of planning policies that we have to look at, and some of those have you know, various different criteria. So what we're required to do is assess um, an application against the development plan read as a whole. Um, so that means that you could have sort of a minor conflict, um, but you have to look at everything as a whole and consider whether it, it complies as a whole. I'm satisfied that this um, complies with the development plan. Um, as we've heard, there are a number of um, significant factors that weigh in favour of this application, the delivery of the affordable housing and the tenure that is most required, um, the improvements to the, the public park, um, the relocation and of the library to provide a better facility. You know, we've heard there's, there's various others as well. So I'll hand over to Chris anyway for the answer on the neighbouring amenity. Thank you, Ros. Um, yeah, just to pick up on the um, councillor, councillor's point about the assessment of impact on neighbouring properties. If you pay, turn to page 65, particularly sections 7.8 through to 66, um, there is a detailed assessment of the impact upon neighbours. Just to briefly set out in summary, those particular or the specific um, issues that we're looking for, impacts upon daylight and sunlight, um, overshadowing and overlooking privacy and outlook. Uh, we normally take a measurement from um, the local plan, which is to, uh, set at 21 metres. 
Um, both of these sites are well in excess of 21 metres. Therefore, we would not consider there to be any constraints in terms of overlooking privacy outlook, daylight and sunlight. We've also had a daylight and sunlight report um, that's been submitted by the applicant. That's been robustly tested by an external consultant, and we're, we're happy with the outcomes. So, thank you. Councillor Corfer, has that answered your question? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but if I may, uh, there's no such thing as a perfect planning application, but looking in the round, taking account of the benefits that have been uh, set out, uh, the recommendation is approval. In, in essence, I'm, that's, that's what I'm understanding from your response. Yeah, that's okay. correct. That's thank you. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is um, parking spaces for the elderly people in the library. I, I think two spaces is not enough. So if they need uh, other people, they need parking. So where they can park, I understand the other car parking next to them are in winter time is really dangerous for them. So could you please give more detail for that? Yeah, Chris, do you want to that? Yeah, I think it's key to, to remember that the existing library doesn't actually, although it, it's built adjacent to a car park, it's not actually named as the library car park. Um, it, there are two spaces being provided. Those are accessible spaces. Um, and the, uh, the new Otterfield Road Library is directly bounded by a council car park, which would provide adequate overflow provision within very reasonable distance to the site entrance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Has that answered your question? Uh, the, thank you very much, uh, officers. I, I understand the other car park is next to there, but I think the crime rate or antisocial behaviour is quite high in that car park. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, if, it, if only I had the power to do something about that as a planning chairman, but we don't. So, unfortunately, <laughs> my remit is, is limited to, uh, to the committee to advise on thing. I mean, this is going to be a car park that will be allocated for the library. Yeah. So there won't be correct for that. So there won't be any charges on there. Whereas, it's, it's, I know the library very well because I opened it, but. But is there anything else, sir? And the other question is, uh, how we measurement the air quality and when we done the last time we measurement, what was the air quality? Could you give us more detail about that? Yeah, so I think Ros alluded to it earlier. It is contained within, sorry, uh, it is contained within the officer comments within the case officer uh, committee report. Um, the, the point with this particular area is, is that the application is actually air quality neutral, which is what most planning applications should be. Um, because of the area it's, wi it's within, um, as Councillor Punja um, pointed out, um, the development is required to demonstrate that it is air quality positive. Um, in, in this particular case, there are sufficient mitigation measures provided in the form of a travel plan, additional tree planting, which would um, certainly um, help with air quality issues. Um, and there's a, an offset contribution which will go towards assisting with delivering the council's air quality action plan. Um, it, it's also worth remembering that this was an operational site on Otterfield Road as a, um, as, as a leisure use, as a swimming pool. It's not at the moment, so the baseline has uh, certainly changed, but if you took it from when the, um, the swimming pool would have been operational, there would have been significantly more trips, which would have been significantly more harmful in terms of air quality than what's being proposed at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, have any idea how many more trees we are planting in surrounding areas? Yeah, so thank you. Um, the development proposes to remove 10 trees. Um, in its place, 30 are being planted, so that's a net increase of 20 trees. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And, and they will be special trees that absorb all the bad pollution as well. Okay. Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got a few questions to put. It's not my committee, but I'll raise a few questions along the line as we go along. Um, the previous health centre that, in, in 2014, there was a, a health centre in Jim and Drelin was supposed to go up on this land. And um, there, was a, there is a section 106 money for health care and infrastructure as part of this, I understand, yes? 
So where is the money going to come from for the health care structure within this plan? Sorry, yeah, it's, it's probably not particularly relevant to the assessment of this planning application because it's clear that we don't have a health centre being proposed, but it is worth noting that um, I actually wish I'd put the, the picture into the, the, um, the presentation. There is a health centre which has just has been opened directly opposite. Um, if I can take you to the car park photo, I can probably show you, show you where it is. Um, So you've got to the, to the right-hand side of the photo, if I was to swing a camera around, which I actually did, but I didn't put it into this presentation, um, there is a, a health centre provided directly within that car park, which is entranced off the car park. Um, so it is worth noting that uh, a recent uh, development has been undertaken and a new health centre open. Thank you, Chair. Johnson Nelson. And in regards to the, um, the environment, he said that, I think the young man was saying, the, the officer was saying early on about the, the green space, he said that, um, there is no provision for more open space within the area. That's my understanding of what he's saying. So within the strategies, there's, um, what are you going to do to create more open space and how much of that is going to be, and how much green space is going to be needed per capita? Chris, I think, can you clarify on that a bit? Perfectly? Yeah, so uh, what I was referring to earlier is um, there was a, a recent case on Tavistock Road where um, uh, I know both myself and Ross sat in on the hearing. Um, the uh, open space strategy was used as a council reason for refusal because no on-site provision of open space was provided and there was also a shortfall in uh, private amenity space. This scheme does very much differ to that because there is a adequate, if not over provision of private usable amenity space um, and communal amenity space. So in, in which case it would only be open space provision that would need to be required. Um, the development plan does allow us to take a financial contribution towards that. However, in the case for the Tavistock Works Appeal, the um, appeal inspector did not necessarily agree with the council's decision to refuse the application based on the lack of open space and saw fit to agree a uh, financial contribution. Uh, in this particular case, the applicant is actually providing an enhancement plan, so that money would effectively be spent in that park anyway, uh, but they're actually proposing to do the works as part of this planning application, and that would be secured within the heads of terms. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Nelson. Yeah, I'll, Chris, if you can go, I, we have answered this question, but you, yeah. yeah, answer it again, please. Yeah, yeah so initially, uh, developments would be required to mitigate their own harm. Uh, effectively, what the, um, the council's air quality officer is saying within this, this committee report is that it does mitigate its own harm through a travel plan, reduction in trips, um, additional tree planting, all of those factors, and a sustainable development make this development air quality neutral. So what we're saying is, is that you're actually uh, uh, required to deliver a air quality positive scheme to be able to have a positive contribution to the existing air quality problems within this area. The offset contribution which is being, or the damage um, cost contribution which is being sought and will be paid for by the applicant will help to the council to deliver their own action plan 
um, to prevent future issues uh, of air quality within this area. But the key point is, is that there is no additional air quality harm generated by this development. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Councillor Garlick, do you want to say something? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my concerns, um, I've got a few. Um, also the one which I've discovered by June about the air quality, because I've noticed that the contribution through S106 agreement is very small. Um, obviously it won't provide or deliver clean air, probably will be used for some measuring equipment to measure air quality, which I think will be sufficient for about a year or so, so it won't contribute much to the, to the, to the plan. Um, my other concern is about um, um, the lack of um, observations from the fire service. I noticed that the total height of a building is just below 18 meters. I think it's 50 centimeters short, which would mean they would have additional staircase to evacuate in case of fire. Um, so that's my concern because I suppose there's only a lift and one staircase for, you know, quite a large number of um, flats. And the final concern is that um, social um, housing is supposed to integrate people. Having such a large amount of social housing in one location uh, does not um, contribute to inclusion or mixed community. Uh, it rather creates um, what I would call residential segregation. And uh, that's of my concern that um, there is no social mixing. Uh, there are just lots of sort of number of people who are on low incomes rather than mixing communities, more inclusive. I have to be very careful what I say. I'm not going to get political about this, but uh, can, uh, Chris, could you answer that yeah, question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll take the, the point on um, the affordable housing first. I think we've got to be very careful, particularly in planning committee, when we are um, in a roundabout way saying that a, a scheme that's 100% affordable, 95 um, affordable units, um, a very good tenure mix that, that is compliant, with the strategic uh, housing, market housing assessment um, is maybe a negative. Um, I understand the points that we're raising around inclusive communities. The development sites are both surrounded by a, a lot of probably what's considered to be market housing. Um, there is a library space, community use space, uh, going to be integrated in one of the buildings. That's certainly a great um, community use space, which no doubt residents from that uh, Otterfield Road block will, will, will use and benefit from. Um, but I certainly think the, the ambitious targets that we've got for um, affordable housing, particularly London affordable rent, uh, need to be met in some sort of way. And 95%, uh, sorry, 100% 95 units is far and above what we've been achieving on other development sites. So I think that's really a benefit for the site. Um, just in terms of fire safety, uh, the building um, to the top of the parapet is 17.5 um, metres uh, and 18.5 metres to the top of the lift overrun and the plant room equipment. Um, yes, the, the, the scheme has been designed um, to adhere to the highest um, fire safety standards in accordance with policy D12. Uh, but we do have a um, condition on page 30, which is condition 33, requiring a revised uh, fire safety strategy to provide further details in accordance with that policy. Um, it is also worth noting that fire safety would also form part of the building regulations application, so um, more evidence and certainly the, um, a more detailed assessment of fire safety would no doubt happen then also. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Garner? Not just the comment, but there was no report from the fire um, services yeah. about it at all. Yeah, it will go into the... As, yeah. as and officers regarding the meeting targets, so uh, we're definitely meeting targets in the south, but our meeting was targets in the north. Uh, we are dealing with the application in front of us. I've let, I have leaned in, 
be lenient about some of the comments that have come out tonight, but it is a very important one. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, when we sit on this committee, we look at a lot of applications and we always say we wish they had more affordable housing. Yeah. And now we have one that has an awful lot of affordable housing and we as a committee uh, sort of say it's, it, it's too much. Um, for all of the reasons that I gave earlier on, um, I would like to propose that we uh, move officers' recommendation for approval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to second the proposal to go with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Chibadart. So I am proposed and seconded. Can I have those show of hands, those in favour with this application, please show? Those against? Okay, so it's noted four against three. Yep, so it's passed. Thank you very much. Okay. We now move on to the second application, item seven, uh, which is 15 Green Lane Northward, and that is Carl, or Hayden. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. So item seven relates to 15 Green Lane in Northward. The application seeks to vary condition two of an approved application. The new proposal involves the removal of a basement, additional overground parking in its place, and enlargement of a cycle store. It should be noted that the approved permission has commenced and therefore the site has in part been cleared. Here we have a location plan, as you can see. The development site is located on the north side of Green Lane. The area is predominantly residential. There are some semi-detached houses, some uh, flats, and some detached properties. In terms of constraints, to the south of the site we have the Glen Conservation Area, to the east you have a locally listed building, and the site is covered by a tree protection order. There are no other notable constraints on the development site. Here we have an approved site plan, so this is what's been approved at the site and what is being constructed at the moment. As you can see with the site's frontage, you've got free parking spaces, some greenery, trees, landscaping, hedging, etc. And what is being proposed is next. Here we have the proposed site plan. As you can see, the greenery on the east side of the site at the frontage has been removed and replaced with some car parking. That is to offset the parking which was going to be provided in the basement as the basement is now being removed. In the bottom left of the image, there is also a small cycle store which is going to be enlarged. Here's a detailed landscape plan for the site. As you can see, although there are going to be some trees removed, when compared with the original permission, we are putting in some new trees. Um, condition 6 has been updated as per the Chair's previous comments to make sure that that planning is absorbing of, um, of carbon emissions. And in the bottom left, you've got the new cycle store, which is going to be enlarged. Um, as mentioned previously, in terms of the actual design of the building, it's going to be identical to the previously approved scheme. So the ground floor is exactly the same. The first floor is exactly the same as approved. So is the second floor and the roof plan. And that's what the building would look like. As mentioned previously, this is um, being commenced at the moment as per the previous application, and the building would still look like this post-development. We're just getting rid of the basement and moving the parking above ground. This is the new cycle store, which is going to be in the bottom left of the site. As you can see, um, there's going to be a bin store, and it's also going to be a cycle store. It's a single-story building. So here we have a bird's-eye view plan of the site. As you can see, it's quite a green, leafy, sort of suburban area. This is the existing street scene. As you can see, hoarding has been erected already at the site, and that's because works have been commenced. This is the site as it stands at the moment. As you can see, the buildings have been cleared, and works have commenced on the foundations. Uh, I just wanted to conclude quickly on this one, and I'll just read this for the purposes of clarity. Uh, the proposed building would look identical to the existing building. Removing the basement would reduce the need for deep excavations, and it would also um, constant material and would reduce the need for constant material movements. The new car parking area would front the street like neighbouring car parks and would provide parking provisions in line with the London plan. Although trees would be lost at the front of the site, new trees would be planted, screening the parking area from the street and adding to the area's suburban character. 
It is therefore recommended that planning permission be granted subject to conditions and planning obligations reimposed from the original planning permission. Um, it should be noted that some residents and petitioners raised some objections about additional vehicle movements caused by the new development and also noise caused by the new parking arrangement. Um, it should be noted for clarity that there is actually a reduction in parking. Before there was going to be 16 parking spaces, now there's going to be 10 parking spaces. So in theory, there should be less parking um, related movements and less noise generated from the site. And the new trees and landscaping at the front of the site should also um, act as some sort of noise barrier to any um, residents on the other side of the road. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Hayden. Okay. Um R. McKenzie. Is R. McKenzie here? No? Oh, well, there's no, there's no petitioner. Did they give a written statement, Ryan? Okay, so then we go to the agent, Tom Roberts. Are you present? Oh, this is evening. That's really good for a long agenda. We don't have any petition that saves us a lot of time. Okay, then. So uh, we'll go straight then to... There's no council as well. The council would be me, but I can't talk anyway. <laughs> So <laughs> we go straight to the committee. Who's going to take me away? Any questions? Anything? Councillor Corsell. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a question around the parking then. So, so cutting to the chase, as it were, uh, there's going to be a reduction in, in the amount of parking. Uh, as part of this application, as I've, as I've understood it. Uh, can I just check the policy position in terms of the requirement for parking in that? Because I couldn't see it in the report, and it may be that I missed it. No, can I have an officer comment on that, please? Uh, Dr. Tilly can give us an answer. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Councillor, it is quite correct. The number of car parking spaces would reduce from 16 to 10. The London plan uh, policy would allow nine car parking spaces so it is one space above the maximum standard permitted in the London plan and I'd also like to point out that the site is situated in an area with a PTAL score of three indicating that access to public transport is reasonable compared to London as a whole there are also parking restrictions outside the site which should um, avoid any problems arising from car parking displacement thank you chairman Thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, I know it well. Just walk up the road as Norfolk Underground Station. So, um, any other questions, Councillor Hossel? No. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, quite a, a comparatively easy application uh, relative to the rest of the agenda. Um, I'm happy to propose that we uh, move officers' recommendation for approval. Thank you. I'm proposed, Councillor Tubidor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I would like to second the proposal to go with the officer's recommendation. Thank Thanks. you. So I'm proposed and seconded. Any other questions? No. Can I show a hands those in favour of this application? That's unanimous, Ryan. So that's been approved. Okay. Uh, we go now to uh, see the house, which um, Councillor Bennett will leave us for a few minutes. Um, what I'm going to do, committee, is I'm going to take eight and nine as one presentation, but the proposal and seconds would be required for both, uh, both applicants, okay? So, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, as with item six, um, I'd just like to um, refer members to um, the addendum. There is an addendum on item eight. Um, which just relates to um, some brief um, corrections regarding the highway section of the report and um, the conditions. Um, items 8 and 9 relate to a full application and a listed building application um, at Cedar House on Vine Lane. Uh, the applications propose the change of use, or the partial change of use, I should say, um, and works to facilitate this change from an office uh, use class B1 to use class C2 to provide assisted living accommodation. Um, the building is grade two star listed, um, which uh, has been subject to 20th and 19th century extensions, which are mainly the locations for these proposed changes. 
Um, here we have the location plan. Again, the location of the site is marked in pink. Uh, constraints plan. Um, so you'll see the red marking indicates that the um, application building is a listed building. Um, just to reiterate, it is a grade two star listed building. Um, location plan, uh, indicating the site boundary in red, um, a further site ownership in blue. Um, so as you'll see here, the uh, area which is to subject to this particular change of use is the northern section of the building, um, and it's indicated on this plan, as you see, C2 and B1. C2 being the um, assisted living, and B1 being the retained office space. Um, you will also note that there are car parking spaces marked in red uh, and in blue, the blue being B1 uh, car parking spaces and the C2 being served by the spaces in red. Uh, this is proposed site block plan, uh, existing plans, existing elevations, existing sections, uh, ramp details and bin stores, which are uh, the main points uh, really for the external works referred to uh, in the earlier part of the presentation. Uh, proposed plans, uh, here you'll see in blue um, the uh, changes which are to be made internally to facilitate the change of use. Proposed elevations, proposed sections, again those parts of the development which are required to facilitate the change are marked in blue. Uh, staircase plans and elevations. Uh, a proposed demolition plan which mainly um, relates to internal works to remove um, some of the existing internal walls. Um, those would then later be replaced by different partitions. Um, here we have a bird's eye view plan and then just some photos of the existing buildings and car park. Okay. Uh, just in terms of the assessment. Um, Chris, can you also go through the items on the next item as well, the photographs that you've got for us? Uh, 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 we've combined those into one, oh, one presentation. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, sorry, Chairman, I should have uh, made that clear from the beginning. Um, just in regards to the assessment of the proposal, the main focus for consideration um, are whether the principle of development is acceptable and whether the proposed works would preserve the historic fabric of the heritage, uh, heritage asset. The principle of the change of use from office to residential is acceptable as noted in the policy um, comments within the officers committee report, uh, which states that there is a focus to consolidate office space where viable, such as a town centre location, and this site does not fall within a town centre. In addition, it should be noted that the London plan indicates there to be a regional wide um, requirement for assisted living accommodation. As such, this development would assist with addressing the disidentified need and in an appropriate location. In terms of the design, the internal and external changes have been reviewed by the Council's Heritage and Conservation Officer, as well as Historic England, who have raised no objection subject to conditions pertaining to revised bin store details. In terms of other material consideration, the application conforms with the relevant development plan policies. As such, the application is recommended for approval, subject to conditions and a legal agreement to secure mitigation me measures su suggested within the heads of terms in the re committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we don't have any petitioners on this. Do you do? You're not. Sorry, beg your pardon. Barbara O'Brien, beg your pardon, beg your pardon. Um, when you, the buttons, you've got your five minutes. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I actually live in number three Vine Lane, which is completely opposite this building you can now see on your screen. Um, I'm going, I was going to come to this point at the end, but I want to mention it now. Can you see how badly maintained that building is? That mould, there's no pointing, there's nothing going on. That's a, this is a listed building within uh, a conservation area in Hillingdon it's pretty desperate that it's got to that state um, and nothing's being done about it. So let's hope that if this goes ahead, whoever is going to develop this will make sure that looks good from now on and not like this. I'm really appalled even seeing it there on the screen. Um, as I said, I live at number three by name, which is absolutely completely opposite. I'm not against the assisted living at all or a care home at all. I think it's a very good idea. We need more. We need more carers to come into the care home as well. 
Um, but what I am against is this, uh, this idea that this is an appropriate place. This road, Vine Lane, is incredibly busy. There's a very busy pub at the end. Traffic comes screaming around the corner there. They're supposed to be 30 miles an hour, you know. Let's, let's hope that it's even anywhere near that. By the end of Vine Lane, it calms down and everything's much better. But it's very, very dangerous here. There is no crossing. Assisted living people will be vulnerable people. They will have to cross the road to do shopping. There's no zebra crossing. There's no way to cross safely. Um, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it has caused death in this road before now. So I'm very concerned about these vulnerable people being moved into this area. Um, I've got it under um, reliable information. There are 400 vehicles per hour down this road. Now, a care home with assisted people who will be able to come and go. There's one care, I think, going to be there for them. Um, I think it's just something is going to happen. Um, very bad is going to happen. I want to know, is there an impact statement on safe living for this property? There's a pub nearby. Will there be CCTV cameras installed to make sure people are safe at night? The pub is not always very good. There's often people, especially Friday nights, Saturday nights, sports nights, where there are lots of cars parked down the road, a lot of youngsters up and down the road. Are these people going to be safe? Um, I also noticed that there's um, no change in the parking in the area when I looked at the, the plans. Um, these disabled people who will be coming to this um, this accommodation may well have their own cars, which will be adapted for them to drive. There will be visitors. There will be carers, possibly multiple carers. Who Will there be sufficient facilities for them? Is there an ambulance point being planned? Is there a turning circle for an ambulance? These people are going to be vulnerable people. Um, is there an electric car charging point? Have all these things been thought about? There's no possible parking on Vine Lane itself. There's huge congestion down there. When there's drop-off for, for, for Bishop's Holt School, you can hardly move down there. The cars are stacked back. Um, it's, it's an alternative route to Long Lane. And in rush hour and pub times, it's really quite a nightmare. Um, what I would like to say is I certainly know about the speed I'm talking about because I'm living here. I'm actually someone living opposite this, so I know how dangerous this is going to be. I don't want to see people killed outside my house because this is not being taken care of properly. Um, I would also like to remind everybody that this is a historic building situated within a conservative area, a, a conservation area rather. Currently, the outside appearance, as I've said before, is appalling. Is it going to be better maintained if this is being developed? Um, and, and is it going to add to the historic area, um, feeling of this area? And last of all, I would like to say if this is going to be approved um, if, the, if approval is going to be recommended, could it be deferred until some of these points I've mentioned have been looked into and made sure that they've been made right? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Barbara Brunt. Okay, um, the agent, Di Petro, or Lauren, no? Okay. Okay, so there's no, we've... Uh, We've lost the applicant, um, councillors. Uh, wait on a sec. I'm not opening it to committee yet. Um, there's no councillors here present. No. Okay. So uh, yeah, straight to committee. I think Councillor Nelson, Councillor Cawthorne, and Councillor uh, uh, Singh. Is it all got? Singh. So Councillor Nelson first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I use this road quite often and quite frequently because my pastor actually lived down that area. And it is rightly a very notorious area as a driver. Seeing that the residents that's going to be housing there um, with disability or whatever um, physical disability they may have, um, it is definitely not safe to to to. Um, be able to use that area. Are there going to be any um, a road plan put in place for that? I was rightly raised about pedestrian crossing. The school also, when the kids come out from school, it it's literally can be impossible. But when it is it's a bit clear, you got those um, road users from the Oxbridge Road trying to do the shortcut down that road is absolutely 
notorious, and um, there's concerns by residents in regard about the, the, the building itself as well, because when you drive down there, you can see, and I've, made, I've heard comments made about the outer building, if it does get changed, you know, is it going to get changed because it's a listed building, a grade two listed building, or is it going to remain the same? And these are some of the concerns that I am aware of made by, because I go down there to visit my pastor, I keep hearing them talking about it. And it was raised during the summertime as well by the pastor because to walk down that that specific area, it is so narrow. So how will we get a wheel? How, how would a wheelchair go down there with people going in opposite direction? Is not enough space. You either step out into the road or you back on the pavement or you have to wait bracing up to the wall. So there is quite some concerns there in regards to accessibility. Chris? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, just, I think I'll take the point just regarding the, um, the proposed use and the, um, the listed building points. I'll refer to Alan. We're lucky enough that we've got a highway expert here, so I'll refer to Alan for the highways points. Um, he can go through those. But um, just in term of, terms of the use, so uh, within the submission, it's quite clear that the development that's being uh, proposed here um, is to offset what what cannot be retained as a viable option for this particular site. Um, it's also very evident through um, other occupancies that we're seeing, particularly in, in offices, even within the town centre, that there is a, a lot of office, uh, vacant office space. So effectively, this building will remain uh, vacant and it will deteriorate further unless we find an appropriate use for it. Now, just in terms of the, the actual design and whether or not um, it meets the policy test of either preserving or enhancing um, the heritage asset. Um, it's the design and um, the, certainly the internal and external arrangements have been scrutinised by both the council's heritage officer and um, uh, Historic England themselves. So I would be confident in saying that subject to conditions, yes, the, the um, development would uh, meet the policy test of either preserving or enhancing uh, the grade two star listed building. Whether that would in, uh, need to include um, the clear, clearing up or repair of the external um, facades, um, that isn't within the scope of the planning application. Um, so I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that, but certainly in terms of the policy, um, it does meet the test and therefore that's why we've recommended uh, approval on both the, poli um, the change of use point and also the quality of the works to be undertaken. Um, Alan, would you like to take the highway points? Thank you very much, Chairman. <coughs> the first point, yes, I can confirm that electric vehicle charging points would be provided. Um, and then with regards to the speed of traffic along that stretch of highway, um, there is a parking management scheme in operation with car parking on the side of the road that you can see there, we've, we've got the white van. That would be the um, western side, and there are gaps in that on-street parking. So that, that acts as an informal uh, giveaway system. So cars need to give way to one another, approaching in different directions, which calms the speed of traffic. Further along Vine Lane, the speed limit reduces to 20 miles an hour, there's horizontal deflections, a width restriction, and the council's recently installed vehicle activated signs that show if you're traveling above the speed limit. Um, in its current use as offices, the development can generate 86 trips on a daily basis. With its uh, change of use to a care home, that number would fall to 16. And um, it's my impression, well, my understanding of the development that its transport needs would be satisfied within the site itself. Cars would arrive and park on plot. People would then get out and visit their family and friends or they would arrive to take care of themselves. So um, the Highway Authority are satisfied that this development would not present a uh, risk to road safety. Taking into account the number of trips it will generate will fall. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just add a further point as well. I mean, just we've obviously heard from the highway expert in terms of the highway's impact. 
Um, I would just clarify as well, um, the, the facility is obviously a care home and it would be, um, you know, it would be operated with staff present 24 hours a day. They're in the business of caring for those residents. Um, and essentially, you know, it's not for us um, as planners to sort of specify how they might manage and care for those residents. That, that would be for the, um, the managers of the care home, essentially. But I did just want to confirm that we have consulted with the adult social care team. Um, they did initially um, raise some comments and this scheme has been amended during the course of the application process to improve um, the internal facilities and provide additional space for the future residents and the adult social care team is satisfied with the proposal so I don't see any grounds for refusal in terms of the safety of the residents. Thank you. Councillor Nelson, any further questions? On? No. Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you. I think Ros has more or less covered my point, but I, I, I would just like to be specific on the supported housing need aspect because certainly wearing another hat uh, outside Hillingdon uh, when I work during the day, I know the views of adult social care are absolutely pivotal to applications like this and that they can, you know, they can fall on the basis of not getting support. So there is a comment under the supported housing section on page 139 where there is a need for uh, clarification about um, an indication of the level of need for this use. So uh, do I take it from your comments, Ros, that we've subsequently had that and we've had some kind of needs assessment that support the view of that adult social care team on this, given that, given that we've established it is a planning consideration? Thank you. Ros, do you want to yeah, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, this has been ongoing for some time and there's been a bit of back and forth, um, but the adult social care team are satisfied and we're satisfied that there's a need for, for this type of um, facility. Okay, so I won't, we'll leave the question of whether there was a need for an needs assessment. I'll, 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 it's implicit in your response that that which has been necessary has been provided. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, officers and the petitioner. I think she raised the valid uh, points. The 20 mile per hour speed is not there than we enter from Duxbridge Road. It's far away than they put the sign 20 mile per hour. Zebra crossing and the traffic and parking issues on uh, Cedar Drive and on the wine lane as well. The people, they park their car and they go to the airport for the jobs. So, how we can improve this? We need zebra cross there, we need, uh, like the officer, thank you for that, they said they improved external building and uh, speed marking. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to take up? Yeah, point? I'll just respond to, to one of the points that Councillor raised regarding uh, parking. Um, as you can see on that image there, and what you can't see on the, on the uh, right hand side of that photo, is that Vine Lane is um, subject to parking restrictions, um, and those parking restrictions are they, they are time period orientated. But um, you would not be able to leave a vehicle on that that road throughout the day, Monday to Friday, throughout the whole day. Um, so I don't I, I believe that there are parking restrictions on there that would be sufficient enough to uh, deter anyone from leaving their, their their car there for the entire day. Councillor Singh, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine, but what about the, uh, yeah. the speed limit signs? Yeah, let me just ask the officers then. Actually, uh, Alan, can you come back on that? Because obviously this application in itself, we would, could, in some applications we could ask for a zebra crossing or some 106 money to provide. Can you just give us some clarity around this for me, yeah? Whether that hasn't been taken into consideration because of X or Y. Is that fair? Is that putting you on the spot too much?
Thank you, Anne. Okay, um, Councillor Gerlich first, and then I'll come to you, Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question about um, what Lady has mentioned about um, when there are ambulances attending uh, the premises. Is there a turnaround so they can uh, ca exit um, facing forward? Is there enough room? Alan, do you want to take that? You're just looking on your phone. Huh? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, officers do check that there's a uh, swept path provided and that vehicles can enter and leave the site in a forward gear. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies, Chairman. I was looking for a, a tracking plan, but it doesn't appear... There we go. Yeah, so you've got a site plan there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move us on because I'm, I've heard what I wanted to hear about adult social care. I think in terms of Councillor Gill's concerns about parking and highways, well, we've heard from the, uh, the, the Highways Authority uh, officer that really apart, beyond the parking requirement, there is no requirement for any additional highways infrastructure. And however well founded that, grounded that may be in, in reality, and often I have reservations about that sort of thing too. I'm not sure we're really going to be able to go anywhere with that, frankly. Um, and with that, I will you know, I, I accept the answers that we've had and I will move the officer recommendation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Chubidart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to second the officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take both of you for 10, uh, for 9 and, uh, sorry, 8 and 9. I hope that's okay. So we'll vote first on uh, 8. All those in favour, please show your hands. Those against? Okay. So it's 3-3, uh, three, uh, three, three, which I have a casting vote. So there you go. So my little privilege I have. Okay, now item 9. All those in favour, please indicate. Those against? Yes? Yeah, okay. So it's the same again. Okay, so it's passed. Both of them passed as approval. Councillor Bennett, I don't know if you can hear me from here, but if you can, please come in. You can. Thank you. Okay, we move on to item 10, which is 10 Norton Road. And that is Christos. You know, I've absolutely mullered your surname, but I'll forgive you for that. Thank you, Chair. So, agenda item 10 refers to 10 Norton Road in Uxbridge. The application proposes the erection of a two-storey side extension and a single-storey side and rear extension. The the application site is located on the north side of Norton, Norton Road and tending to the constraints plan, the site is located within the Greenway Conservation Area and you can see the green area just to the south and east which represents the green belt. The application has been referred to committee as a petition and objection has been received along with six neighbour representations. These, the issues raise concern, character and appearance considerations, residential amenity, the potential use of the property as a HMO, and parking. These matters have been fully addressed within the officer's report. So just to refer back to the existing plans here, the existing dwelling comprises of a two-storey semi-detached dwelling house. Uh, it currently has five bedrooms, three within the first floor and two within the roof. Just the side, the existing elevations shown there. Just moving on to the proposed plans which show, uh, so these have been amended during the course of the application to show the existing conservatory to be removed. That's shown at the rear of the property. And the window has also been changed in the, in the extension to match the existing. 
So the proposal is for a, a, sig a single story site in rear with a first floor site extension. The exterior materials are proposed to match the existing dwelling and you can see that the, the scale and proportions of the site extension are sort of reflective of the existing site extension of the neighbour at number 12. Just to move on to the, um, the aerial photo, you can see the residential site context. And just moving through the photos, so here's the photo of the site frontage. You can see the property is set back from the highway with an area of hard standing providing parking spaces for two to three cars and the existing garage which is to be removed. Another shot showing the, uh, the neighbour number 12, which you can see the their two-story side extension, which is very similar in appearance. A further view uh, just of the wider street scene facing west. A close-up of the frontage showing the adjacent neighbour number eight. And the widest street scene photo showing um, yeah, just a general view facing east. So as detailed in the officer's report, the development is considered to preserve the appearance and character of the conservation area and would not impact on neighboring residential amenity or on parking, which are the predominant issues raised by the petitioner. The application is therefore being recommended for approval subject to the conditions detailed in the officer's report and in the addendum sheet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Christoph. Um, okay, so we have a written response uh, as a petitioner from uh, James Newton. Over to you, Ryan. In June, residents submitted a petition with 26 signatures objecting to this planning application because of their concerns about inadequate information, overlooking, poor design and harm to the Greenway conservation area. This followed the unlawful construction of a very large conservatory extension built without planning permission when work was done at all hours and without consideration for the neighbours. Enforcement were notified but did not keep us updated or take action, leaving us in limbo. After the planning application and our petition, we made inquiries and had no response until our local councillor got involved. This was worrying as we thought no one was listening. It is welcome that the plans now show the conservatory extension has now been removed and changes have been made to the facade, thanks to officers. However, there are still concerns that the property is too wide, far in excess of current policy, creating a terracing effect contrary to the character of the road, that the property will be too large to be much needed family accommodation and will default to being an HMO, noting that the proposal would include more building at two storeys than number 12 and already includes an irregular full third storey on the outrigger that the proposal does not step back at ground floor. This is a different building to number 12 with a different entrance location providing different design challenges such as brick matching. Brick matching. This application illustrates the concern local people have over recent developments in the Greenway conservation area and the pressing need for a conservation area appraisal which would identify what is significant and protect the things that contribute to character. For example, walls and gardens at the front of properties already lost in this case so that gardens contribute towards green space and attenuation and do not just become parking lots. The spacing between houses which would be lost between number 10 and 12 not a pair as stated but different houses. There is much to protect in the Greenway conservation area with its unique history and its development described to some extent in the Hillingdon Townscape study. We believe that a conservation area appraisal would assist officers, save their time, and preserve the valuable and valued asset of the Greenway conservation area. Thank you. Um, I believe the agent said he's going to be here but doesn't wish to speak, so um, that's Albert Ogun Sayer. Not here? Don't think he's here anyway. Okay, uh, there's also a written sense from Councillor Burns. Apologies for not being there in person tonight, but I would like to make a couple of comments on this application. I fully support the residents in opposition to this application. The residents and I appreciate the hard work put in by the planning team in negotiating conditions with the applicant, 
in particular over the removal of the conservatory and some better detailing on the front facade. However, the property as proposed is too wide, far in excess, in excess of the current policy, creating a terracing effect contrary to the character of the road. The worry is that the property is too large to be a family accommodation and will end up as another HMO in the Greenway Conservation Area. On the subject of the conservation area, this application illustrates the concerns local people have over recent developments and presses the need for a conservation area appraisal. Thank you. Before we go uh, to the committee, I'm just going to, instead of me, you don't want to hear me speaking all the time, I'm going to just ask officers about that there's Article 4 and explain what that is in here. So, Christos, do you want, or Katie, do you want, nice to see you, but sorry. The other one, the other button, the other button. Um, <laughs> um, thank you, Chairman. Um, so there is an Article 4 direction applicable to this site, so that means um, it removes permitted development rights to turn the property into an HMO without planning permission. So um, regardless of whatever size HMO they intend to turn it into, if that is the case, it's not being proposed as this application, but in the future um, they would need to apply for planning permission so we'd be able to assess it that way. In other words, it's just a safeguard for us. So that makes it sure that uh, anything. So Councillor Bennett and Councillor Tubert are the got so far. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you answered my first question, which was going to be on the HMO. Um, could we just go back to the slide that showed the plan of the street, just with the uh, buildings uh, sort of marked out? Um, yeah, it's your photograph? I, no, no, the plan, just where it showed the road with all of the different plots next door to each other. It was just to pick up on the point that the, both the petitioner and the wall councillor made around it, that one there not really being in keeping. When I was reading the papers, I was looking and actually quite a lot of the properties on that road seem to amass yeah, to the full right. width of the Chris, plot. if you can put it onto the photograph as well, there's a um, photograph that shows it as well, Councillor Bennett. Keep going. Yeah, that'll do it. I mean, you've got, you've got a very dated sort of garage there that's going to be too small to be used for any sort of modern vehicle. Mm. So I can understand the need to want to, to do something with that. And next door, you can see they've done their extension. And next door have gone out. It, it, you know, it looks in a way as if it's one of the few properties on the road that actually hasn't, hasn't been done massed yet. out. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chubino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you've answered my question. I was going to ask for a condition to be added for HMO, and it's been responded to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cawthorn. Just coming back to the question of width and the terracing effect which it suggested by the petitioner uh, could result from this development. I mean, I'm, I'm taking it the officers, I mean, these things are subjective, I know, but uh, the officers don't accept that analysis. Can I just have a comment on that, please, if I, if I may? Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Councillor Cawthorn. Um, so they'll be maintaining a separation distance of 1.25 metres from their boundary, um, so they, they wouldn't, there wouldn't be a terracing impact from that. Which is, if I may, through if you, you, Chairman. If you, look at, if you look at the photograph on, on the screen there, you can see that the, they've got a gate next on the opposite property. Yeah. So it's going to be similar to that. So that's about one point metres. So it's essentially going to be a bit bigger than that. Okay. So it's about a gate and a bit. It's one point so five it, metres, correct? Yeah. yeah. So it, it is consistent with the prevailing street scene then? Yeah. It is all I'm asking. Exactly. Okay. All right. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think this property is already four bedroom at the extent two more bedrooms. So we have enough parking space. Could you please give us more details? Yeah. Alan, do you want to pick up that one? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, the development will provide two car parking spaces. The London plan standard would be 1.75. So two car parking standard, two car parking spaces is the max maximum uh, policy would allow. Thank you, Chairman. So, Councillor Singh? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Garlic, you indicated. Or was it Thank just a flash of a hand? <laughs> After you, yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to state that um, change of street scene in a broad sense, it's not only the, the frontage of the house, but also the build up in the back. And regarding the licensing of HMOs, as far as I know, 
none of the application has been received, re refused at least this year. So well, I, there is every, an end every, every, of As you know, and you yeah. should know now, that every application is judged on its own merits. What we can, all we can do is we can protect residents by putting Article 4 on these properties. But everybody has the right to put a planning application in. So, okay. Right, is it Councillor Bennett? Yeah, I mean, just picking up on Councillor Gaelic's point around the massing at the back, it's, it's valid, but again, when you look at that plan of the street, the property, so it's not only the width, but it's also the depth, depth yeah. is, is, is as aligned across them all. Um, I, I am happy to propose that we move officers' uh, recommendation for approval. Brilliant. Councillor Tubidar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to second the uh, officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. So I'm proposed and seconded. Can I show our hands those in favour with the officer's recommendations? Yeah. You, any refusals? You get one against. You can abstain. It's, there's, you know, you have a choice. So, so there's one short. So it has been approved. Is that okay? Well done, Ryan. Okay, so uh, we go on to item 11, which is 45 Fraze Avenue. Hayden. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so item 11 refers to 45 Fraze Avenue. The application seeks planning permission to replace a bungalow with a two-story, four-bed house. It's worth noting that an identical application was approved at the site in 2017, so this application is to reinstate something which has already been approved. In terms of location, the site's on the south side of Fraze Avenue. The area is residential, properties are detached and semi-detached. They're predominantly two stories in terms of the height. As you can see on the plan, the River Colm is to the west of the site. Uh, here we have the constraints plan. Uh, the purple hash lines show that the site is within the West Drayton uh, Garden City area of special local character. The development site is also within a tree protection area. Uh, there are no other notable constraints. Uh, here we have the existing plan showing the bungalow which exists at the site at the moment and is going to be demolished. Here we have the proposed ground and first floor plan. As you can see, the property is larger than the building which is going to be demolished. Here is the roof plan. And here we have the proposed elevations. As you can see, uh, the property which is being proposed is going to be vaguely in line with the neighbors in terms of its height. Uh, it's also of similar width. Despite its depth, there are larger properties in the area which extend uh, much deeper into their gardens. There are also some which are a lot smaller. Uh, as you can see in terms of design as well, the property is quite contemporary with comparison to its neighbors. But as I'll get to the photos later on, you'll know that there are a lot of other properties in the area. They're all unique in their design. There is no uniformity. So it sort of sets a precedence for having something which is a little bit different visually in this street scene. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of the plan. As you can see, we have um, a residential area, as I pointed out earlier on. This is the existing house, which is going to be demolished. This is the view towards number 47 and some other neighbours. As you can see, we've got some flush front elevations, some gables, um, dormers on the sides, dormers on the rear, dormers on the front. That is a long distance view of the street, again showing neighbours. Here are some of the other properties in the area. As you can see, there have been some new builds recently constructed. And as you can see, um, like I said earlier on, properties vary in terms of their design and style. Uh, just to conclude, I wanted to say that uh, taking into consideration that there has been no change in planning policy since the previous approval to warrant refusal of the application, planning permission has been granted for an identical development at the site and the proposal is recommended for approval subject to conditions. The full reasons for approval are set out in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Petitioner M.A. Thompson. Okay, lovely. Members of the committee, <clears throat> I attend this meeting tonight not in an attempt to prevent redevelopment of the plot on number 45. In fact, we are very keen to see the redevelopment start so that we can get some neighbourly stability rather than an HMO. But I comment simply to protect my dwelling place of 29 years from irreversible consequences of overdevelopment next door, leading to loss of privacy, natural light 
and scenic viewpoint in a beautiful location. Many other residents will suffer a variety of different consequences, and I speak on their behalf too. The key issues are constructing what in all but description is actually a six bedroom, three story building, which stretch the building lines beyond reasonable limits for the plot size. This in itself would not impact number 43 uh, so devastatingly if the proposed new front building line were able to be brought forward to compensate, as it is the back of my property that will be overshadowed by the proposed large structure extending some 3.5 metres or more beyond my build line and only one metre from my boundary fence. So my question is, why hasn't the front build line um, of the existing structure been able to be rain, made ta sorry, maintained, retained? Sorry. It is really uncertain as to where the 45 degree visibility angle from number 43 has been measured from. This is of great significance and can make such a dramatic difference to the rear building line if it is not calculated correctly. Our bedroom window, for instance, although it may look like a single frame, is in fact two separate windows. If the building goes ahead as proposed, bearing in mind that our property is broadly south facing at the rear, our patio will be shaded by the large structure from around mid-afternoon in the summer. Sunlight and scenery that we have enjoyed there for 29 years. The 45 degree angle needs to be properly measured and openly discussed. Keeping to the existing front build line would of course negate this problem. It is worth noting at this point that there is already variation in the building line on our side of the road as can be seen on the plan drawing that you just showed. The report document reference 24351 and other numbers, section 7.08 impact on neighbours goes into some detail about the possible negative impact on number 47, but makes no mention whatsoever of number 43. My chalet bunger, though, will suffer the most severe consequences, and I do provide some photos for that. I don't know if they're there or not. <coughs> but uh, you'll note that we are to the left of that, and it's hardly visible in the pictures that, that have previously been shown. Um, we're not issued, you know, we're not there at all. Uh, this omission also occurred in the original application, but as we were never notified of the final planning appeal date, we were denied the opportunity to question it. This is also referenced in the planning report document in section 6 of the comment from West Drayton Conservation Area Panel, which highlights the impact on neighbouring properties, confirming that, and I quote, will take light from the rear of number 43 and will have an overbearing effect on the properties on both sides. Again, an adjustment to the front build line would negate this. In the section of the document headed planning officer's comments, it states that there is no kitchen extractor shown on the proposed plans, when in fact an extract system is shown, certainly on some drawings, as blowing directly onto our patio adjacent to our French doors. Could this please be clarified and or amended to redirect the airflow if the plan goes ahead as, as, as shown? Uh, once again, retaining the existing front build line would probably negate this issue also. There are other references in the document similar to similar applications and pictures shown there that were approved on number 20, number 40 and also number 47. Number 20 is some distance away and does not really affect the cul-de-sac environment of the higher numbers in the avenue. And number 40 is built on a double-sized plot which significantly reduces the impact of the building on the neighbours. The two-storey plot at number 47, although indicated as having habitable roof space, there is clearly not sufficient height and width to allow comfortable habitation, but more suited to storage. To sum up, we welcome a new development on the land, but I humbly request that the committee revisit and reconsider the basis on which the original plans were approved, and a few minor adjustments, as highlighted, would make a world of world of difference to the potential dominance and thus the acceptability as neighbours of the new structure. Should our request to shift the front build line be rejected, then the issue of height would become more relevant. The, the height of 8.41 metres would tower well above our property, which is 6.4 metres at maximum. Would a 300 millimetre raised base for flood prevention be included within this height, or would it be Don't, additional? Sorry. Sorry. Okay, if anyone on the committee is unclear, please. That's it. Thank please you talk. very, very much. Uh, the uh, agent, Mr. Panasar, are you here? 
I'm the owner, Mr. Kundra. Okay, Mr. Kundra, would you like your five minutes? Yes, okay, yes, please. Um, as, as we uh, previously know, this planning application was approved. Uh, it was approved meeting the policies uh, uh, that we had uh, put before us in the planning. This was done via a pre-planning application which was put in and with a bit of going back and forth we came to this design which the planners are fully aware of, you know, having spent several months working on it. Um, it was previously approved and it was previously commended by the planners on that committee meeting. It's the same application, no changes have been made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of things. Um, on the drawings, it looks like there's an error. Um, there's some sort of staircases on the side. I don't, I don't, they don't exist. So, can we note that? Yeah. Can you show? Yeah. If you could just turn to the elevation drawing. Um, it looks like the stairs have been sort of plotted through on the side elevations. That that we've confirmed they're not shown on the floor plans. What we could do for the avoidance of doubt, if the members were minded to grant permission, is add a condition just to say that we'd require um, corrected plans to be submitted prior to commencement, Aiden, just for clarity. Do you want to show them on the screen, please? No, it's just the side elevation. Elevation. Something that I just noticed. I'm sorry. There you go. It looks like there's a staircase running up the side there. I'm sure it isn't. <laughs> but it does look that way. Okay, and also, um, can officers put Article 4 on here as well, please? Okay. Sure thing. Okay, Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Chairman. I, I hate to appear slow on the uptake, um, uh, but just on a point of order, I'm, I'm just interested in uh, what's before us this evening. We've heard that this application, an identical application, was approved some time ago, so there's that precedent and, and planning history. So I'm just interested in what is actually before us this evening. What will we be asked to decide? Is it within our gift to unpick any of that? Because I suspect not, and unless the answer is something different, I, I would move to recommendations. Try and answer that, but officers can bounce me in if, they, if I'm wrong. Yes, that you're absolutely correct. It's, it, it's a, it, the termination has expired, so it's redeterminating that it's come through. We don't, we can't change the plans as it's such, but we can make observations and slight changes to conditions. As I've just asked officers now to put Article 4 onto this, so that if the uh, someone after the applicant decides to sell and wants to change the HMO, they have to come back to the committee to do that so um, yeah so I think I'm correct yeah and Ros is going to correct me for everything you just said. <laughs> Thanks so. Chair. Just to further clarify so when this application was previously considered um, there, there was a different development plan so we need to look at this application against the current development plan. I think the key the two key issues that I'm sort of hearing today um, and were obviously key issues as part of the assessment is the impact on the character and appearance of the area and obviously neighbouring amenity. So I think what um, what is, I think, key advice for me to give you is to consider um, what were the material changes between when we considered it last time and now we're considering it now. So yes, the policy um, wording is slightly different, but in terms of the physical context of where this building sits in the street scene and its relationship with neighbouring properties, um, that has not substantially changed. So for us to draw a different conclusion on those matters now, I feel that um, you know we could be seen as unreasonable in the event of appeal and it would be likely that we wouldn't win the appeal. Just talking about appeals, um, I'm not sure whether this has already come up, but um, just to make you aware, so when this application was approved previously, um, the council did impose a planning condition restricting the height of the building, um, and that was taken to appeal, and um, the council lost, so that um, condition was found to be not necessary or reasonable. So, you know, in considering that, obviously the inspector felt that the height um, was appropriate, so that's just some additional information there. Mm -hmm. just come, come back then. So, it, in essence, the application is identical, but the policy framework around it has changed. Yes, yeah, it's been updated. Yes, you're right. Any other questions? Councillor Bennett? Um, could I just pick up on the petitioner's point around the extractor fan outlet? I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that we're able we do. to do anything about, but the, the, the location of it and blowing over the patio. 
So um, what I would say is that's not really a matter that we would generally get into um, considering. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you could add to a property. It would be de minimis. You wouldn't need planning permission to add it. So when you start to think of it like that, for us to control it, um, you know, would be unusual. And, it, you know, an inspector might consider that that was an unreasonable condition if we were to, you know, ask for details of that. And I'm sure the applicant will uh, maybe have a flu that goes a little bit higher on it just to for navally contact. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers. Could you give us more detail about the next door neighbor's privacy? Will we are meet that criteria or overlooking? Aidan? Yeah, so in terms of the development's impact on the neighbor and privacy, what we have at the moment in the area is a lot of two-story properties that already have either rear first floor windows or they have rear dormer windows and those windows provide views into the gardens of neighbours as well as um, the gardens of whatever the host dwelling is and for that reason putting in a dormer at the back would likely give the same view as those existing windows in the area so there'd be no uplift in privacy loss or overlooking because in this area, we have houses which have first floor windows which already look into each other's gardens. Also, we've put a condition on the application to restrict the insertion of any other first floor side windows which would cause privacy. And in addition to that, we've also made sure that the side windows which are being proposed are going to be obscure glazed. I hope that answers your question. Councillor Singh, is that fine? Thank you. Okay, great. So, sorry, sir, I can't, you can't speak. Uh, um, no, no, I'm afraid not. We're, the application is in front of us. I don't take questions from the floor, I'm afraid. Councillor Bennett. Uh, yeah, that, the, the response there from Hayden did kind of answer my question in terms of, um, uh, of, of the, the sort of other properties on the street and how they overlook each other. Um, I, I, you know, I, I fully empathise with the, with the petitioners. Uh, thoughts and comments on this um, and a very good speech but this application as it's already identically been approved before I think we are our hands are tied in a way with this uh, particularly learning around the appeal so um, uh, I'm happy to uh, propose that we move officers uh, recommendation for approval thank you mr. chairman I'm quite happy to second the proposals Thank you. Uh, that's been proposed and seconded. So can I show fans all those in favour with the officer's recommendation with the additional condition for Article 4? That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, that is the end of our petition um, applications. Uh, members, do you need a comfort break for five minutes or are you okay, all okay to carry on? No? You're fine? Okay. So we crack on then. Uh, next application is Harefield Academy. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to start off with, I'd like to highlight that there is an addendum for this item. There are some amendments to conditions. This would be interesting. So, item 12 relates to the Lord Adonis House, which is a vacant and decommissioned residential school building. The building forms part of Harefield Academy site which is a secondary school and sixth form located in Harefield Village. The, the site is located to the west of Norfolk Road and is accessed from the south via Norfolk Way. So here is the constraints plan um, and shows that the primary constraint for this site is its green belt designation. Uh, the nearest residents to the site are located approximately 30 metres to the east on Norfolk Road and there are some other properties further to the west as well. So this is the existing location plan, showing the broad context. Uh, more zoomed in, existing block plan, showing that the site comprises a, the residential school building, three tennis courts, um, soft landscaping, hard, hard standing, and a car park. So these are the existing north and south elevations. The existing east and west elevations. Just I'd like to point out here that the, the existing building is three stories in height. This is a satellite image of the site. Uh, it shows how it currently exists. And here are some photos. Uh, this is the 
loaded on his house as seen within the site. Um, this is um, the site as viewed from Ash Grove, which is to the east. This is the site as viewed from Northwood Road, uh, more to the south. Again, from Northwood Road, you can see how, how screened the site is in terms of um, tree planting. Uh, this is the view from Northwood Way, and again from Northwood Way, but, for, but a bit further afield. <coughs> so it is highlighted that the major applications uh, planning committee recommended a similar application for approval in July 2022. Uh, the application sought permission for a change of use and extension to facilitate a, a special needs in education um, school and was approved formally approved in February 2023 of this year. So the current application is very similar, um, but seeks permission to demolish the former residential school building uh, and construct an education facility for uh, SEND students. Um, permission is also sought for ancillary structures, a, a multi-use games area, play area, uh, vehicle access, landscaping, and car parking. Um, so this is the proposed site plan, um, just to explain how it would work in brief. Uh, students will be brought up, dropped off to the east of the school building, turn to the right of the plan there, and vehicles will leave via the new vehicle access onto Northwood Road, again shown on the east, eastern side of or the right, right side of the plan. Uh, the multi-use games area and play area proposed to the north, and the staff car parking is proposed to the northeast, no northeastern corner of that site. So this is the um, proposed ground floor. Um, can't see the detail, but it does say that it includes new, new classrooms, a library and common room, space for independent living, uh, dining, fitness room, and other ancillary uses. This is the proposed first floor, uh, with much of the same uh, proposed uses in terms of classrooms, etc. This is the proposed roof plan, uh, which includes gr a green roof and PV panels. Proposed elevations, um, these are the north and south elevations, and these are the east and west elevations. Um, the east elevation forms the primary frontage and would face Northwood Road. So the, this plan shows that eight trees will be removed and 51 trees will be planted as part of the proposals. Uh, the remaining trees, trees will be protected and retained. Um, so, in summary, the proposed school would contribute much needed SEND school places and is supported in principle. The proposal is considered to be appropriate development within the Greenbelt, without detriment to the street scene, neighbour amenity, the local highway network and air quality. Subject to planning conditions and a legal agreement, the application is recommended for approval. Uh, I pass back to you, Chair. Thank you, Michael. Brilliant. Okay. There's no petition, Councillor Cawthorne. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction. And I, I can see that there is clearly some great benefits and some great ways attached to the additional uh, special educational need provision. But I do have one or two questions, if I may. Um, one of them is around the, the question of um, sustainable waste, uh, uh, sorry, sustainable water management uh, and the need to avoid uh, uh, rain, uh, rainwater runoff. And I just wonder whether sustainable urban drainage systems, stroke permeable surfaces are part, are part of that, if I can I just understand. Is there a requirement for it? It's the first bit, and is that part of, of what's being put forward? That's my first question. Okay. I can do the second Michael, bit. Michael, do you take that? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so the application did submit um, a uh, drainage strategy as part of the application. Um, this is... Um, written in accordance with local plan, London plan requirements. Um, that being that there, there is sustainable um, drainage measures proposed. Um, there would be um, increased uh, soft landscaping and attenuation as, as part of the proposals, in, including a green roof. Um, and obviously considered this to be acceptable subject to a planning condition, which is, um, this is under condition 14, and this would secure, secure the final detail of of any such uh, drainage strategy. Okay, uh, through you, Chairman. A uh, couple of others, if I may. Um, 
Uh, I'm not quite clear on uh, the, the, the green belt aspect is touched upon in the report, and I'm not, not quite clear whether this is a, a greater footprint than uh, that which exists at present. Uh, it's just clarity on that point. And there's one final question, if I may, uh, and that's on page 247. There's a point four there, reference to site layout, a short paragraph from the uh, Urban Design Officer follow-up, and it's talking about it's not been sufficiently justified why this approach would not be feasible in relation to uh, amalgamating car, both car parks. Has, has that been superseded? Is, is that all the information, or is that, is that still relevant to what we're talking about? Michael, did you catch that? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so in terms of Greenbelt, I can clarify that there is an increased footprint. Um, I think from memory, 36% increase. Uh, there is also an increased volume, which is equal to approximately 50% volume. But there is a what we consider to be a sufficient decrease in height. Um, equal to 3.3 metres in height. Um, so when we look at Greenbelt sites, um, we look at the, the National Planning Policy Framework, um, paragraph 149, part G, outlines what would be considered appropriate development on Greenbelt sites which are previously developed. In this case, um, there isn't considered to be a greater impact on the openness of the Greenbelt uh, because of, one, the reduced heights, but two, because of the kind of enclosed nature of the site. There's, there is quite a significant boundary planting as existing, and this would be retained as part of the proposals and would, if, if not actually enhanced as part of the um, tree planting proposals. So again, in respect of Greenbelt um, development, it is considered appropriate and it therefore accords with planning policy requirements. Um, and what was the, the final point on the urban design officer's comments? Can I repeat the second question? Yeah, it's... No, you've got it. I think you've got it. So it's, um, urban uh, design, yeah? yeah so uh, uh, the urban design officer did raise certain concerns over the general uh, approach of the design, um, but one of the main things to bear in mind is we have already seen this, uh, essentially the same proposal previously, and it has been approved at committee back in July 2022, um, uh, and approved this year formally in 2023. Um, so I don't think it's reasonable or robust um, to seek further amendments as part of this application proposal. What is, what is uh, shown before committee today is, uh, what, is what offers considered to be a sufficiently acceptable in, in design terms. Um, yeah, so. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah just, just briefly, I, uh, just on the green belt, my only worry is that we, we don't undermine our policy in relation to the green bit elsewhere. So no need for a sequential test, or have we done that and we still we, we, we think that? Um, I, I'd have to step in because I know the site quite well because obviously it used to be my ward. Um, that area wasn't really green belt anyway. That was the hard standing uh, courts and other things there. So it wasn't, I know it's in a green belt area, but the area that they, because it's already um, a, a boarding house there so yeah. they've just taken that away and there was parking around that boarding house so, so they actually in some ways you could say that we've actually put more green back okay so in short no need for a sequential test no. okay. I, don't, I don't think so but I'd, well officers it's, it's, it's officers don't think so either that's, no, that's good I by don't. me chairman michael yeah, i could just add that um we don't we would only see a alternative sites assessment in in the circumstance that it was considered to be inappropriate development within the green belt but in this case it is considered to be appropriate development okay any other questions? Councillor Bennett, Councillor Gielek. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, for me, I mean, I, th I think this is a great proposal and the amount of greenery and new trees proposed is, 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 is fantastic to see. It is the opening paragraph on page 217 for me that cemented the need for this application and the approval around the urgent need for more SEN places yeah. uh, at secondary school level in this borough. Um, yeah. And I think all of us have to have that in mind. Um, uh, it was a very, very detailed report, um, and I'm happy to propose that we move officer's recommendation for approval. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Gurley. Oh, thank you, Chair. Just um, wanted some clarification about the external lighting. Could we have any more information? Are there any restrictions? Um, Michael, do you um, want to pick that up? Levels and the, the timings? Yep. Um, so, um, under the application, there were a lighting details submitted. Um, it was considered to be acceptable in principle. We have secured by condition um, further detail to make sure that it, it, it would be 
uh, acceptable that is secured under condition number 20. Um, that's a, that's a good you, question. Yeah, Michael, can we just take well, the lights will, they're not going to be permanently on, are they? They're on a, so I don't think there's um, specific restrictions on timings of, of lights, so we could add that as yeah, can a... We, can, we, can we have a look at that to make sure that we don't have light pollution? I know it'd be low-level lighting, but there is housing opposite. Mm. And I know the trees will screen most of it, but can we just make sure they are down downfitting? Ros, I don't know if we can do anything like that. Thank you, Chair. We do have a condition, um, number 17, with regards to landscaping scheme, which does cover lighting, but we could add some, um, some additional wording in there just to explain that um, the details should demonstrate, you know, um, reduced light pollution and impacts on ecology. That's it. Is that okay, Councillor Darling? Right. Brilliant. Councillor Singh, you indicated. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, officers. Uh, so I'm a second uh, of the officer's condition. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Councillor Nelson? I just want to make a query inquiry about um, solar system and self-sufficient in energy. Is that part and parcel of the plan? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so this, this scheme is proposing um, to make carbon emission savings by energy efficiency measures, um, the provision of PV panels on the roof of the proposed school building, and air source heat pumps as well. And from memory, uh, the savings achieved on site are actually um, carbon net positive. So they're, they'd be generating more energy um, uh, than required. So I think from memory, 111%. Um, and that's secured by condition and the legal agreement would safeguard that, that provision as well. Okay, councillors, that's fine. So I'm proposed and seconded. Can I have those show hands in favour of the application with those slight amendments? That's unanimous. Thank you. So we'll go to item 13, Haysbridge Retail Park, Oxford Road. And that is Michael again. Thank you, Chair. Um, same situation here. Um, I would highlight that there is an addendum for this item. There is an amendment to a condition. I believe it's in relation to pollution absorbing uh, planting. So item 13 relates to Haysbridge Retail Park on Oxbridge Road. The site measures approximately three hectares in area and is located on the south side of Uxbridge Road and north side of Bullsbrook Road. Our residential properties are located to the north and commercial buildings are located to the east, south and west. So this is the constraints plan. Uh, the site is identified as forming part of a designated strategic industrial location, as shown in yellow or orange. Uh, the nearest residents to the site are located over 40 metres to the northeast on Uxbridge Road. So this is the existing building layout plan and identifies that there are seven units, uh, only two of which are operational, including Halfords and Dreams, uh, leaving five vacant units on this site. Uh, this is the existing um, elevations. Uh, the primary public facing elevations are at the top. Uh, two, Im two images uh, showing the north and the east elevations. This is a uh, satellite image of the site as it currently exists. And some photos as seen from Oxbridge Road. Uh, this is looking towards the Metro Bank, um, towards uh, the main body of the site, the, uh, the junction to the site, uh, neighbouring properties along Oxbridge Road, and more uh, properties along Oxbridge Road leading into the neighbouring borough. So this application seeks permission for the demolition of existing buildings and construction of a single building for industrial and warehouse purposes. Uh, comprising 16,000 square metres floor space, approximately, uh, ancillary offices, a service yard, car parking, and landscaping to the front. Uh, this is the proposed site layout plan, showing that the commercial unit is proposed to sit on the southwestern site um, section of the site, with ancillary offices sp uh, space located to the north, alongside car parking and a landscape buffer. The service yard is located on the eastern portion of the site, would only be accessed via the junction with Uxbridge Road. This junction would be reconfigured to include a toucan crossing and a reduction in number of lanes turning out of the site to reduce conflict with vehicles. The access from Bullsbrook Road would only be used for emergency vehicles. So this shows the proposed building layout in more detail. Uh, the main footprint of the building is proposed as warehouse space with, tr with a transport office and dock 
docking spaces on the east side, and the main entrance, core, and cycle parking spaces on the north side, shown to the right of the plan. This is the uh, proposed office layout located at the first and second floor levels of the northern side of the building. This is the proposed transport office, again with similar uh, open plan offices. Uh, they propose a roof plan. Um, green roofs are proposed on top of the ancillary office spaces, um, and PV panels are proposed on top of the main warehouse building. So officers had discussions with the applicant on the proposed design during the application process, and amended plans were submitted. Uh, the two, top two images show the north and east elevations, which would face Uxbridge Road. Uh, the bottom two images would be less prominent when viewed from public vantage points. The sawtooth roof form is considered to add visual interest, and the location of the offices on the northern elevation is considered to activate this facade. Um, to summarize, the proposed development would intensify the use of a strategic industrial location with an appropriate use and is supported. The economic employment uh, and employment benefits of the scheme weigh in its favor, especially considering the high vacancy rate of the existing units. The design has been amended and is considered to be acceptable and balanced. Development would also secure improvements to the junction with Oxford Road, including a Toucan Crossing and off-site highway improvement works. A financial contribution towards air quality mitigation measures has also been agreed with the applicant. Uh, subject to planning conditions and a Section 106 legal agreement, the application is recommended for approval. Uh, I pass back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Michael. That's a good report. Anybody want to start me off? Councillor Nelson. Uh, just one query you said about the, the road layout, going south all the way. Yeah, I'm going according to south all the way. The road layout, you've got one, two lane, you've got a bus lane, you've got one lane, then you've got a filtering lane. Would that not be, did you say, would not be anymore? So um, just to clarify, there would be only um, alterations made to the lane arrangement within the site, so within the red line of that plan shown there, uh, to the top right. I don't know if I ever read this uh, oh, around here. Yeah. Um, so the, the, at present, there are two lanes um, going out of the site. Um, and as part of the proposals, that would be reduced um, to one lane. And uh, this is viewed uh, favorably by highways officers because it would reduce uh, the, um, the potential for conflict between vehicles at this, at this junction. I got you. Yeah, got you. Now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it's where houses go that the applicant has gone to great lengths to make it look as uh, attractive as possible. Um, I, I was trying to think of the last time I went down to this retail park, and it was only about four or five years ago, and every single one of the units was full, and the car park was full, and it's a sad reflection on where we are now that only two of these units uh, are in use, and, and you don't know for how much longer that would carry on. Um, I think it, it's great that somebody wants to take this on and, and remove what is, you know, currently an eyesore on the landscape and just another reminder of the number of empty retail units we have in the borough and, and turn it into something that will create jobs and, and boost the local economy. So uh, with that, I'm happy to propose that we move officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Well put. Councillor Tubidar. Just to say, I'm happy to second the proposal. Brilliant. So I'm proposing to second it. All those in favour, please indicate. That's unanimous, Ron. Thank you. We go on to item 14. Just when you thought you had enough of warehousing, you have another one. And this is you again, Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, Right, so yes, uh, again, uh, just to highlight that there is an addendum on this item with the same amendment um, on the conditions. So item 14 relates to land at Ainscough Cranes in Hayes Industrial Park. The site currently facilitates a B8 storage distribution use on a piece of land measuring approximately 1.2 hectares in area, located on the southern side of Rigby Lane or Swallowfield uh, Road. Uh, industrial buildings are located to the north, east and west of the site and a railway sits to the south. So here is the constraints plan again. Um, the site is identified as forming part of a uh, designated strategic industrial location. Um, the Grade 2 listed registered parking garden is also located approximately 120 metres to the north. 
Uh, the nearest residents are located 70 metres to the south on Stormont Drive. Uh, this is the existing site layout plan um, and identifies a, s a collection of smaller commercial buildings on the existing site. So the elevation of these buildings are shown here, uh, showing a range of heights from one to three storeys, approximately. Uh, this is a satellite image of the site as it currently exists. Uh, here are some photos from the access point. Um, this photo is looking east. This photo is looking south. You can see the cranes there, industrial nature of the site. And this is looking west. Um, so this application seeks permission for the demolition of the existing buildings and construction of a single building for industrial and warehouse purposes comprising 7,500 square meters floor space, ancillary offices, landscaping, and servicing. Oops. So this is the proposed site plan, showing that the commercial unit is proposed to sit on the eastern section of the site, uh, with the service yard and car parking located in the middle and the access road to the west. An area of landscaping is proposed to be retained and enhanced in the northern part of the site. So this shows the proposed layout of Unit 1. Uh, the unit mainly comprises warehouse space with ancillary offices at first floor level. Uh, this is uh, the proposed layout of Units 2 and 3, again with the same arrangement with warehouse space and uh, ancillary office space at, at the upper floors. And this is the proposed layout of Unit 4, again with the uh, exact same arrangement. <coughs> Uh, so the roof plans are split into four. Uh, this is the roof plan for Unit 1, Units 2 and 3, and Unit 4. So the roof will use a slight pitch uh, with PV panels and roof lights um, integrated within, um, and it would sit behind a profiled cladded parapet. Shown on the elevation here. So the top, uh, top image is the main western elevation, which would front onto the service yard. Uh, the bottom image is the main northern elevation, uh, which would front onto Rigby Lane. And these elevations are activated by ancillary office spaces, the glazing, and the cladding. So this shows the elevations in more context and shows that the building would sit slightly above the height of neighboring industrial buildings. Um, to summarise, the proposed development would intensify the use of a strategic industrial location with an appropriate use and is supported. The economic and employment benefits of the scheme weigh in its favour. Generally, the design of the building is, is considered to be high quality. There are some concerns over the height of the building, but it was reduced um, by 2.5 metres to approximately 15 metres. Um, the nearest residential properties are located a significant distance away and no comments were received during public consultation. Um, as such, the visual impact is not considered to be significant. The development is also accepted with regard to its impact on the local highway network. The applicant has agreed to pay contributions towards local highway improvement works and air quality mitigation measures. Subject to conditions and a Section 106 legal agreement, the application is recommended for approval. I pass back to you, Chair. Thank you, Michael. Well done. Um, he's going to take me away. Dan Spenett. Um slightly less attractive warehouse, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, again, a, a good investment in our borough. When I went through the papers, um, it's pleasing to see that, that, you know, businesses and companies want to invest in Hillington. Um, and on that basis, I'm, I'm happy to uh, propose we move officers' recommendation for approval. Thank you. Councillor Jubilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm quite happy to second the proposal. Okay, I'm proposing seconding. All those in favour of the application, please indicate. It's unanimous. Thank you. So that's been approved. Item 15, Norford Hills Library. Christos, it's your turn now. Thank you, Chair. So, agent item 15 refers to Norford Hills Library, which lies on Potter Street in Norfolk Hills. 
The application is made by the council and proposes a demolition of the existing library and the erection of a mixed-use building with a replacement library on the ground floor and nine residential units above. So the site lies to the east of Norfolk Hills Roundabout at the junction of Potter Street and Pinner Road. In terms of constraints, the site lies directly north of and adjacent to the Northwood Hills Town Centre and has a PTAR rating of three. The existing library is single storey with a floor area of 450 square metres. Its main pedestrian and vehicular access is taken from Potter Street. Turning to the proposal, the ground floor would repurpose the library with a floor area of 460 square metres, so a slight increase. And that would comprise a reception area, flexible event space, reading areas and meeting rooms. The library would be accessed separately by its entrance off the roundabout um, and the flats accessed separately via Potter Street. On the first floor, a one bed and three two bed flats are proposed along with a podium area, which would provide communal garden space for occupiers. On the second floor, there are a, there's one bed, one three bed and two two bed flats. On the third floor would be a one bed flat and a three bed flat. And this floor would be set back behind the, the main building. So turning to the elevations, so the development would be three and a half stories in height which is a similar height to the neighbouring school and sixth form buildings, and also a similar height to buildings along Pinner, Pinner Road and Joel Street. The exterior materials would be secured by condition to ensure the development harmonises with the street scene. Uh, I'll just take you through the aerial photos now and the, uh, the street views. So here we just see the, the site location again, so you can see to the East, the college building and the school and the surrounding residential area to the north and west and south is the town centre. So here we have a photo from Potter Street, just showing the frontage of the library. And again, another view from Potter Street. Here's on, uh, from Potter Street, sort of facing south towards the high street and the roundabout. A photo taken from Joel Street, facing north towards the library itself, and another one there from the roundabout. And here, just opposite from Painter Road, and similarly, Painter Road again, and another one just further down, showing the wider context. So the application has generated one neighbour representation expressing concerns regarding loss of daylight, privacy, and traffic. The application is supported by a daylight, sunlight and overshadowing assessment and as detailed in the officer's report, the matters raised have been considered fully and no harm is identified. To conclude, the development would be of a suitable density to provide an appropriate housing mix, whilst also bringing public benefits in the form of a new and much improved library. The application is therefore being recommended for approval subject to conditions and the section 106 agreement detailed in the officer's report and the addendum sheet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Christos. Um, Councillor Burnett? <laughs> Councillor Gawthorne? Any other questions? It's like the Adam show um, this <laughs> evening. Um, I guess that the thing that stood out for me with this application, and it's the same with Yuzu Library, is you know, at a time when other local authorities are closing libraries, reducing the number that they have, you know, we're investing in them, building new facilities for the future, um, and I think this ticks all the boxes. Not only do you get a brand new library, um, there is sort of a future revenue stream for the council and more homes which we are targeted to build. Um, and so uh, I know Councillor Cawthorne has a question, but I am I am happy to uh, propose that we move officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Councillor Cawthorne. Yes, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to second that, actually, but I did have a question at the same time, if yeah, I may. And it's just around the parking uh, situation. So we've, on page 454, we've got, uh, in, the, in the bottom paragraph, we've got a bit of some commentary around the uh, 
basis upon which we've arrived at the parking provision. It talks about statistical data uh, and assumptions made behind that. Is it actually based on uh, practical experience at the current library, or is it based on a statistical analysis of what we might reasonably expect in, those, in that situation? But subject to the answer to that, I'm happy, happy to second. Yeah, I think basically it's to do with the PTAR rating and the um, other things. But I've also did request before that the three bedroom uh, units are, have dedicated parking. I'll let officers come back to me on that. Alan, do you want to step in? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, the library will occupy a town centre location, and uh, we believe it's anticipated that those people visiting the library will already be in the town centre doing their shopping, having a cup of coffee. A library of its own accord is not anticipated to generate single-purpose trips. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, does that answer your question, Councillor Gordon? Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Can I ask about the dedicated parking, Christos, for the three-bedroom properties? And also, we must go to the amendment, uh, the addendum as well, because. Um, the report is slightly inaccurate. There, there, um, there is a CP uh, control parking zone there, uh, but that's been now rectified in the addendum. Yeah, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the parking allocation plan has been secured by condition 22. Okay. Um, and through that condition, we will then prioritise the um, parking allocation to the free bed family units um, accordingly. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I'm proposed and seconded. Can I have a show of hands all those in favour with this application? Councillor Nelson? Yes, thank you. That's unanimous. Okay, so item 16. Can we take item 16 and 17 together, are they? Yeah. So we're gonna, you can present 16 and 17 together, thank and then uh, we'll do two votes. Okay, after you, Chris. Point the wrong way. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, so uh, I will let you know that I have combined a presentation for 16 and 17 together before I start presenting this time. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as seen on the screen, we have a full planning application and a listed building application. Um, you will recognise the site uh, location. It is, in fact, the building that we are sitting in at present. Um, Uh, yeah, so the description of development is as reads on screen. Um, essentially, the development is to uh, install uh, a variety of air source heat pumps, um, including the chimney roofing, um, and also to provide um, some external alterations to the building in order to, prov um, to uh, provide an uplift and enhancement in energy efficiency and thermal output. Uh, here we have the location plan. Uh, as I explained, you'll recognise the buildings in pink. Um, they are the Civic Centre buildings that we're sitting in at present. Here is a bird's eye view plan. Um, the building is a Grade 2 listed building. Uh, therefore, one of the key considerations is whether or not the proposed uh, external, internal, um, and the provision of uh, air source heat pumps uh, does in fact uh, cause any harm to the historic fabric of the grade 2 listed building. Uh, here we have a location plan. You'll see um, various red outlines. Those red outlines do indicate the location of the air source heat pumps. Uh, here is an existing plan. You will see a very complex roof form in front of you. Uh, that is those lines which you see. Proposed site plan. Uh, a proposed roof and ground plan, proposed roof and ground plan again. Here we have some proposed elevations, um, some proposed elevations there again, some more elevations. Uh, you'll see some indication there of the uh, uh, red metal louver fencing, uh, which will be used to screen part of the uh, enclosed air source heat pumps. Um, here we have a roof works key plan uh, indicating the locations of those um, that development roof uh, plan proposed to the west side, east side, 
there are some upgrades to some of the windows which are proposed and the indications of those locations are shown on these plans. Um, effectively, that is to introduce secondary glazing. Again, secondary glazing treatments and there's just a key of photos for where those locations actually are. Okay, so in, just in terms of the assessment um, of the application, the key consideration is whether the proposed works to the Grade 2 listed building would preserve the historic fabric of the heritage asset and whether the proposed air source heat pumps would result in a harmful impact uh, upon both neighbour amenity and the character and appearance of the street scene. It is noted that the air source heat pumps which are located on the edge of the service yard will require chimneys which will be partially visible from around the site edge. However, there is a boundary wall uh, which would shield most of the views and give, uh, and given the un, un, utilitarian, uh, ut utilitarian sorry, uh, nature of the service yard, the potential harm would be limited. <laughs> Uh, for, furthermore, the works to, to the building have been designed to limit any potential harm to the heritage asset. Significant benefits are considered to arise um, from both the provision of air source heat pumps and the external works which would result in a significant upgrade in energy efficiency, performance and carbon savings. The works to the building have been designed to limit any potential harm to the heritage asset. Taking these points um, into consideration and no set out in more detail within the committee report, the applications are recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. I think it's quite self-explanatory, but who wants to... Councillor Bennett. I don't even think I signal. I just, you did. I just your get eyebrow, approached. Your eyebrows. Bro. My eyebrow, Roger Morris. <laughs> um, uh, I'm putting my hand up like a busy um, Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it was kind of partly lost on me with the technicalities of some of these when I was looking at the, uh, the roof plans, but you know, bringing the Civic Centre up to a more environmentally friendly uh, condition that is befitting of the 2020s is, is critically important. Um, I'm happy to move, uh, propose that we move officers' recommendation for approval. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think everything's straightforward and better for everyone, so I'm second. So I've got proposer and seconder. Can I take you proposer and seconder for both applications, Bruce? Yes. So can you please show our hands on the application 16 first? That's agreed. Can also show our hands on item 17. Okay, that's unanimous on both accounts there. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending the meeting tonight. Thank officers. We didn't think, I didn't think we'd get this, this finished this quickly. So well done to everybody and uh, have a good night.